Our email has been hacked. The attackers broke into the mail server and gained full access to our personal correspondence. All confidential messages and accounts associated with the mailbox ended up in the hackers' hands. But we were prepared. In fact, we deliberately created this mailbox to lure the hackers in and try to track them down. Here's how we did it and what we found. This video was created by SumSup, the verification platform. We make the digital world people-friendly, yet secure. To find out how email is hacked, we decided to create a honeypot, a decoy mailbox for hackers. We didn't use public email services for two reasons. Firstly, if hackers change the account password, we can't recover it quickly on a public server. Secondly, our own mail server allows us to track when and with which IP address it was accessed. To realize our idea, we paid for hosting and registered a new domain. Then we created a mailbox in our domain and organized correspondence in that mailbox, filling it with messages from Enron's email database to make it appear as if it was an active use. We changed the names and domains in the Enron messages and subscribed this box to several popular mailing lists to get more messages in it. According to the legend we invented, the owner of the box is an ordinary programmer. So his box contains business and personal correspondence. We created the text of personal emails using ChatGPT. Artificial intelligence did a pretty good job. We placed an email in our inbox with the subject line, your login and password in the hope that the attacker would be interested and open this email. Inside the email, we placed a tracking pixel, a transparent picture of one by one pixel. The hacker trap is ready. Let's see if we can achieve something with these methods. You may have received messages claiming to be from the administrators of your mail server, stating that your account password is about to expire and needs to be changed immediately. These emails are sent by cybercriminals in the hope that you will visit a fake website and enter your login and mailbox password into a fraudulent form, which will then be passed on to the hackers. They send out tens of millions of these emails every day, and we get these emails too. Let's take a look at the code of this webpage. We can see that another web page is embedded in this web page, and this, in turn, contains a form created using this free service. With it, you can create various forms for feedback and data collection. Well, let's make the hackers happy and enter our username and password into this forum, as well as our mailbox address. Attackers who use mass phishing emails usually do not use hacked mailboxes themselves, but sell their logins and passwords to other hackers. Using a special website for information security professionals, we found other phishing forms and then entered our email account login and password into them. We hoped that this way, our chances of catching the hacker would increase. We filled out five forms in total. Nothing happened for a few days. Then, on day four, someone opened our bait email. Our server recorded the IP address of the device on which the email was opened. First of all, we decided to determine the geolocation of this IP address. To do this, we use the IPlocation.net service. In Linux, you can do this by using this command in the terminal. As we can see, this IP address is geographically located in Russia, Kaliningrad region. However, the definition of the region where the hacker is believed to live does not give us much. Also, IP addresses can be dynamic and belong to several subscribers of one provider who access the internet at different times. Let's try to find out a little more about this IP address. The service iKnowWhatYouDownload.com collects a database of peers and SIDs of all public torrent files, which can be used to find out what was recently downloaded from torrents from this IP address. As we can see, the user with this IP address has downloaded several pirated Mac Music applications, Films such as The Walking Dead, House MD, The Boss Baby, and The Dark Knight, 
This user likes computer games such as Flat Out, the Far Cry series, and Sims 4. He also seems to be a big fan of Joanne Rowling's work. Google's search engine allows us to find a lot of useful information on IP addresses. To properly generate an IP address search query among the following sources. Public directories. Configuration files. Database files. Logs. Old data and backup data. Authentication pages. SQL errors. To find such information, we will use Google Hacking Tests and Pen Test Tools services. The search was unsuccessful. Let's search for an IP address in the leaked databases using the Leak Lookup service. No results again. So we found out that the user who opened our tracker email is located in Russia, Kaliningrad region, connected to the internet via Tele2 mobile provider. Also, this user, or users on this IP, probably uses an Apple Mac computer, likes music, the game Far Cry, Doctor House series, and loves Harry Potter. Not much, but that's all we've been able to find out. Now let's try to find out how much it costs to hack a mailbox to order. And how cybercriminals operate when their goal is not to get as many credentials as possible through mass mailings, but to hack a specific person's mailbox. We will use online forums where cybercriminals advertise their services. We will hire a hacker to hack into the mailbox we have created. We will monitor his actions and find out what he's going to do. In most criminal forums, transactions are made through an escrow, a reputable intermediary. The customer transfers money to the escrow, but he does not pay the money to the executor until the executor provides proof that the order has been fulfilled. The intermediary's services typically cost 3 to 5% of the order value. A study conducted at the University of California, San Diego, USA, found the following prices for email hacking. As you can see, hacking mailboxes on Russian public servers is the cheapest. Hacking Gmail and Yahoo is the most expensive. We tried to find a hacker who would hack into our mailbox and provide evidence of the hack. Send an email from the hacked mailbox or provide a secret code from an email message we sent to the mailbox. The hackers offered the following items. $400 for hacking the email and a 50% deposit. They also asked us to send them all the information we know about this user. Typically, attackers use three methods to break into emails. Brute forcing, forcing a password using a dictionary. This method does not work on public email servers because they have built-in brute force protections. And in other cases, brute forcing is only possible if the victim uses a simple dictionary password. By the way, you can learn more about real brute forcing attacks in our previous video. Next is searching for your password in leaked databases. From time to time, hackers steal user databases from various services, such as online stores, forums, or delivery services. Such databases are sold on the darknet. Many of us use the same password for multiple services, including email services. If attackers manage to find such a password in the leaked databases, they can use it to gain unauthorized access to your mailbox. Social engineering, especially phishing, this is the most common method. One of the hackers we hired told us a day later that he had successfully hacked into our mailbox, but that we had seen no related activity. As proof, he sent us an email purporting to be from the hacked mailbox. The email turned out to be fake. If we look at the headers of the email, we can see that the address of the sender of this message was forged, and it was sent from a completely different mail server. We informed the hacker about this, and he stopped contacting us. Another hacker also told us about a successful hack, and as proof sent us a screenshot of the hacked mailbox. This screenshot was photoshopped. This is what the contents of the mail actually looked like. We asked him to give us the numerical code from the email we sent to this address, but he was unable to do so. 
Thus, the two hackers turned out to be scammers who collect payment from hacking customers and do nothing because they're sure that the customer will definitely not go to the police. The third hacker tried to break into our mailbox using brute force, but was unable to crack the password. It seems that during the attack, the hacker used a special program that sends requests through proxy servers because the authorization attempts came from different IP addresses. After the brute force attempt failed, the hacker decided to use social engineering. Researchers at the University of California, San Diego, have identified five types of phishing emails. Attackers typically impersonate a person known to the victim, a stranger, a bank, Google, or a government agency. The hacker we hired sent us three phishing emails on behalf of LinkedIn, Xbox Online, and Adobe. The first email, sent on behalf of LinkedIn, contained a link to a phishing site with a fake authorization form. The address of this site is different from LinkedIn's real address. The second phishing email contains a link to another fake authorization form. The URL of this site is also fake, plus it contains our email address. If we change the email address in the address bar, it will also change in the phishing authorization form. The link in the third email sent on behalf of Adobe didn't work. If we examine the page source of these fake authorization form websites, we can see that the hacker has copied the form of the real website, specifically LinkedIn, and simply changed the parameters of the form so that it sends him the information entered in the form fields. We examined the source of the phishing emails we received and found that the sender addresses were spoofed and the technical headers of the emails contained fake addresses like mail.example.com. We did not respond to these messages in any way, and a short time later, we received another one. The link in this email opens through several redirects, and then the user's browser is checked by the Cloudflare service before being redirected to the target page. Attackers do this to confuse the users and their antivirus software. In total, we received five phishing emails from the hacker. Since he didn't know what services the mailbox owner was using and we didn't give him any additional information, he used the most popular services, such as LinkedIn and Microsoft. Phishing emails can be distinguished by the following characteristics. The URL of the pages linked to in the email differs from that of the real site, and the link may be opened via several redirects. Also indicative of phishing can be urgent requests to confirm your address or other personal information or non-personal appeals such as Dear Customer. Scammers who carry out targeted phishing attacks hide out on hacker forums, sending emails in the name of a fake sender and therefore are anonymous. It is literally impossible to identify them, so they feel completely safe. The main conclusion from this experiment is that the hack is only successful if the victim believes the scammers and enters their login and password into the phishing form created by the attackers. Our experiment shows that social engineering, or phishing, remains the primary method for compromising email accounts. Researchers at the University of California have also found that hackers can use malware to hack email accounts, namely RAT, Remote Assistance Tool, a program that allows them to take control of an infected computer. A modified version of TeamViewer can be used as a RAT. Therefore, Complex passwords and two-factor authentication should be used to protect against hacking. The study we quote states, However, we found that two-factor authentication still proved an obstacle. Attackers doubled their price upon learning an account had 2FA enabled. At the same time, hackers have the tools to intercept 2FA one-time codes. In particular, they can create fake forms that verify these codes in real time and use the resulting data for authorization. Therefore, using two-factor authentication alone is not a guarantee of security. You should not click on links in emails, even on behalf of your ISP or mail server administrator. If you do open such a link, carefully check the URL of the page it takes you to. It is also a good idea to use antivirus software with a web antivirus feature. Such programs use databases of fraudulent addresses to block users from accessing fake sites. Of course, there is a time lag between a moment when a phishing site is created and when its address is added into the antivirus database. But in some cases, using antivirus can be effective and provide an extra layer of protection. In addition, many public email services have tools against potential attackers. 
For example, Gmail may ask you to enter the account holder's phone number, enter an SMS code, or solve a capture when you try to sign in from a new device. You should not disable additional security options when using these services. P.S. While we were making this video, someone tried to connect to our SMTP to send spam. This is probably the main reason why attackers send phishing emails to everyone without a specific purpose.